Hey there, everybody. This is Jeremy with another edition of Abolitionist Abstractions. It's been a little while since I've done one of these, a combination of equipment failure and life getting in the way of my activism has prevented me from doing the rants as I walk my dogs as the original plan was. But now here it is. We're uh, just starting February in 2016. And I have uh, something kind of important that I want to say, and uh, I just figured I couldn't wait any longer. So I have a, uh, a new project I've, I've kind of been tossing around in my head and uh, trying to work out with a few other people uh, that kind of stems from a conversation I had with a woman I was put in touch with because she was in need of some assistance. Um, a few weeks back, I was contacted by a friend of mine who was from the other side of the country, um, but who had been put in touch with this woman from here in New Yorkistan, who was having issues with the CPS um, and was being harassed and was in desperate need of somebody to talk to, so you know, possibly some money for legal costs and uh, you know, uh, possibly some other things too. So I reached out to her and uh, about two weeks back, we sat down and had a chat on Skype and we talked for about three hours. And she explained her story to me. Um, and basically, she has two daughters. Uh, one is now off in college. Uh, I believe she might be in her second year now, or maybe it's just her freshman year. I'm, I'm not positive about that. But, but one of them is now off in college, and the other one is about 16 um, and working her way out of the school system. Uh, a few years back, there had been some issues, um, and she, this woman had inadvertently allowed CPS access to her family because she was not as well-versed in liberty as she is now, um, and she didn't think she was doing anything wrong, so she thought she had nothing to hide. We know how that goes. Um, and basically, her one daughter uh, had had some problems in school, um, she ended up removing her from school, homeschooled her for a year. Then the daughter wanted to go back. So, you know, wanting to try to do what was best for her daughter, she said, fine. They found her a new school. Um, after about a month, didn't work out. Daughter wasn't happy. So again, trying to do what was best for her daughter. She said, okay, then come home and we'll try to, you know, we'll figure something else out. But unfortunately, because of the prior con contact with the New York Estan CPS, um, the New York Estan government took exception to this. They needed to know why she wasn't in school. They harassed her. Um, they threatened this woman. Um, you know, we, we had Carlos Morales on, on the Seeds of Liberty podcast uh, a couple months back, you know, and he, he's a CPS whistleblower and he talks all about this, about how that's how they're, tra you know, the CPS workers especially, that's how they're trained. They're trained to, you know, you make yourself sound more official than you actually are because they have a quota system and their job is to get kids away from families in certain numbers every month and they will make sure they do that um, but i digress so anyway this woman um now was being harassed because her daughter wasn't in school um it got so bad that she was arrested a couple of times she was threatened with arrest more times um, her daughter ended up moving out of the house because of all the things that were going on because the constant harassment by CPS because they were trying to track her down. They were trying, they were always trying to get in touch with the mother. Um, they would just show up places randomly. Um, and the daughter was, you know, she was getting freaked out by this. So she ended up moving in with a friend and her mom didn't want to let her go, but understood that, you know, I can't really blame you. These people are constantly harassing us. Um, and she ended up going back into school. Um, again, this wasn't good enough, though. Now CPS wanted to know the location of the new school because they wanted to keep showing up. Um, and and they when they finally when they finally got it, that's what they did. They would show up and harass this girl every two weeks, you know, for no reason. She hadn't done anything wrong. Her mother hadn't actually done anything wrong. They just 
they wanted to harass her and because of the fear and ignorance of most people they just let these folks walk in oh you're with the government okay you can do whatever you want so this went on and they ended up harassing her until her daughter turned 18 and went and then eventually went off to school but then they couldn't hurt, they couldn't touch her anymore because she was no longer a child in their eyes so they couldn't do anything unfortunately that's not where the story ends because she has a younger daughter so they just retrained their sights and now they've been harassing her over this daughter similar scenario constant harassment more threats of arrest more court dates threats of contempt of court for not will because again same situation she her daughter's in a school her her her, her other daughter is now in a school where she doesn't want them to know so she doesn't tell them and she shouldn't have to because again she's not doing anything wrong her daughter's not doing anything wrong so she basically has had to go into hiding for the past couple of years because they just show the, the agents of the state, whether CPS, st- CPS with law enforcement, law enforcement, just show up randomly and threaten her because she won't disclose the location of her daughter's school because her daughter asked her not to. Simple as that. So they keep bugging her. They keep harassing her. She's had to go in hiding. And that's how I ended up getting brought into this because... Now she has another court date coming up. Um, she is obviously having problems with funding because of all the you know all the money she's had to shell out already. Um, her public defender the first couple of times around actually just totally sold her up the river and basically told her that she had to she basically had to give them what they wanted or they were going to throw her in jail. Like the, the public defender didn't, didn't even attempt to help her, so that wasn't really an option. So she set up a fundraiser account, um, which I will put uh, in the show notes. Um, And she's actually reached the goal that she had on there, but that's just for the retainer. Um, But I was asked to intervene or at least see if I could help in any way because money isn't the only issue. Um, You know, like I said, she's been in hiding for a couple of years. She's basically been bouncing from place to place just so they leave her alone. Now, she doesn't attend any of her court dates physically. Because since everything has happened, since all of this harassment, the arrests, the constant threats of arrest, which has led to obvious anxiety, um, coupled with the fact that she has she had some health health issues to begin with, and now has even more because of complications with everything else, this poor woman actually has a, co- a documented case of PTSD from what has occurred to her at the hands of the state. She is unwilling to go into a courthouse because she is afraid of what might happen there because loud noises and stuff kind of freak her out. And understandably, when you have cops, CPS workers, agents of the state just randomly showing up at your house, your place of business, any time of day, banging on doors and stuff, you can't really blame her for being a little upset about this. So she has managed to be able to call in every time. So, but she still attends. She every court dates, and she's not ducking the court dates. She does just like she wants to go through with this to get it over with because she just wants to be left alone. But she just refuses to give up her daughter's school location or her daughter's location, whichever the case may be at the time, because she doesn't think she has to. And I agree. So she she she's been doing this for a few years now, and during the course of our conversation, she said something to me that got me thinking. And it wasn't a direct request for help. It wasn't a direct, it wasn't even so much a statement as it was almost like amusing the way she said it. And because she was telling me a couple different stories and she kind of, you know, she was getting a little weak. Um, she wasn't feeling very good. And she, she said she needed a second. And then she just got to talk and almost like she was drifting off. But it was just that she was thinking out loud. And what she said... At, like I said, it it was it almost wasn't to me. It was just kind of there, and it, but it was. I often think about what goes on, and what has happened to me, and how I haven't done anything wrong, and how there must be other people like me, and how nice it would be for people like me. If there was some kind of I don't know. Underground railroad or something to help us. 
just to protect us, just to keep us safe. And then she got quiet again for a little while and then went on with another story, almost like she hadn't said that. It was, it was, it was almost surreal. But when she said that, the first thought that popped into my head was, why don't we have that? I mean, sure, there's, there's people that, you know, harbor fugitives. Um, there's stories of people creating human shields around an individual who's about to be arrested for committing a victimless crime and uh, people just forming a wall and saying, no, we're not going to let you take this individual. Um, you know, I've seen a couple of those over the past few years, uh, but not as many as I would like. Um, now I say this not ever having participated in one of these situations, although I've wanted to on a number of occasions where I've seen something happening, but I've asked the people around me and nobody was willing to stand with me. And while I am definitely willing to stick my neck out there a lot more often than some other people may be, um, going one-on-one -on -one in those scenarios is never a good idea because sure, I could get in front of the individual that's about to be arrested, but I will quickly be tased and handcuffed and I'll be joining him in the back of the cop car. So I will have solved nothing. Um, if that happens and there's a bunch of other people around, then, you know, at least there's a chance of something positive happening. But, um, but you know, I, like I said, I, I, I wish, I, I wish there was more of that. And, you know, normally when you hear people har about harboring fugitives, I mean, they try to make it sound all, you know, bad, but, um, you know, normally it's like family members or friends just hiding somebody who, who do has done something wrong and they're just trying to protect them. Well, I'm not tr talking about trying to protect those people. You know, when I had that thought run through my head about after, after this woman was speaking, it was about people like her. You know, people who haven't done anything wrong, people who all their their only sin is committing some victimless crime, you know, violating some arbitrary edict written by some would be tyrant at some time because it somehow benefited most likely him and his cronies and whoever else they were protecting by writing the law, reg, le, re, uh, you know, regulation, um, whatever it is. Um, so. These you know, these people that haven't done anything, most of them will go through the system thinking, well, I haven't done anything wrong and the system will protect me. And sometimes it might and a lot of times it doesn't because even if you haven't done anything wrong, if you violated some arbitrary edict, that, that's all that matters to them. So I, I got to thinking about this and, you know, I thought about the obvious downside, um, you know, even pr proposing such a proposition as I'm doing right now is a very risky thing. What I am talking about here is recreating a system that helped free people over 150 years ago, but just like that system is in direct violation of the laws of the land. So yes, I am proposing something that involves a lot of risk. So I've thought this through. The way I look at it, and I've said this many times, and I'm sure I will say it many more. The quickest way to make any law go away is to make it unenforceable. And realistically, that only takes three to five, ten, I guess, if I want to be super generous, ten percent of any given population just simply saying no. You don't have to have a violent revolution. You don't have to take in any over any so-called federal lands um, and, and run the risk of what unfortunately ended up happening in Oregon, you know, earlier, you know, a few, few days ago um, when that poor guy well, 
in my opinion, got murdered. Um, but that unfortunately is kind of the inevitable result of dealing with the state in those situations. So I'm not talking about stuff like that. I'm just simply talking about people just standing up and saying no. So with that in mind, I decided to try to reach out to people and see if there was any interest in this idea. Um, I have tentatively named the project Operation Tubman Redux uh, for obvious reasons. Um, the general idea is just to create a network of people that are willing to help um, and willing to risk a little bit in the process. Um, and it doesn't even have to be major help because a project such as this will require a number of hands, obviously not too many where it gets out of control. Um, not that I want to have any kind of centralized power or anything, of course, um, as decentralized as possible, but you know, there, there's obviously going to be trust issues here. Um, but you know, I'm not just talking about people that are willing to give up their homes. I'm talking about help in the sense of people that are willing to put an individual up for a night, um, a week, maybe a month, maybe more. If you need house sitting, sure. So that type of thing, if people have that type of stuff, that would be helpful too. But even beyond that, even just people that are willing to give rides to help somebody out, you know, to transfer them to one location to another. Um, you know, another thing I thought of, uh, which is something I've actually done for other people in the past is like midnight moving parties, you know, people that need to get out of a certain location in a hurry. And again, I'm not talking about like violent criminals. I'm talking about people who have just run afoul of some arbitrary edict. So basically anybody who has violated anything that isn't murder, rape, theft, assault, or fraud, they're not really doing much wrong. So people like that, they deserve, you know, they deserve a little protection. I'd like some in, in, in the same situation. So, you know, this is kind of my way of paying that forward. So, you know, people that are willing to give rides, people that are willing to do, do the moving stuff, people that are willing to, you know, if it's somebody who is going to go into court eventually, you know, give them rides to court, you know, whatever. Just, you know, somebody who could be there, just, just somebody who's willing to be a voice, uh, uh, an ear, Somebody who's just willing to say, hey, I can't physically be there for you, but if you just need somebody to talk to, if you're having a bad night, like all these type of things would be huge. So that's what I'm looking to do. I'm looking to create a network of people that are willing to do this. And like I said, there's risks involved. I get that. Believe me, I get that. You know, I've I've said this uh, a couple of times before, and and I mean it. I'm not trying to make myself out to be a martyr. I I don't want you know if there was a way for me not to be a the public face of this idea, I'd probably be okay with that. But I don't see too many other people jumping up and <laughs> saying that say, saying they're the ones going to take the reins on this. It's got to start somewhere. So. I'm willing to put myself out there. I'm willing to put this message out there and say, hey, who out there among you is willing to take part in this? Who out there among you is willing to try and take a huge stab at the state? You know, we, we sit around and a lot of us sit around and talk about, you know, how, you know, how things could be and how, how nice it would be and just the state's in the way and there's just certain things we can't do. Well, that's true. There's certain things that we ha that we're unfortunately stuck with this at this point in time, but there are ways we can start circumventing things and trying to make it a freer society. I think this is one of them. You know the the whole reason that I adopted the abolitionist moniker a couple of years ago was because when I thought about it, I realized. That's really what I am. I'm an abolitionist. I stand against all forms of human slavery. And that includes tax slavery. And that's what we are. That's what anybody who lives in on any patch of dirt that's ruled over by some government who charges the, them some fee for services, whether they asked for them or not, 
whether they make use of them or not, you are a tax slave. And when I use that language, there's a lot of people who get very uncomfortable and, and or dismissive. And they either accuse me of being hyperbolic or they insist that I am being disrespectful to the chattel slaves and what they had to suffer under. Unfortunately, many of those same people have no problem looking back at history to say, I don't know, the Egyptians and their slaves, the Jews at the time, and saying, yes, the Jews, they were slaves. It was horrible. And it was. I agree. Unfortunately, what most people don't realize is that the Jews at the time under the Egyptians were not chattel slaves. They were tax slaves. They lived under a very similar situation. So why is it acceptable for them to be known as slaves, but not us? Something tells me feels have gotten the way. Because the reality is, most of us were placed here due to an accident of birth. Our parents hatched us <laughs> on a patch of dirt that we had no control over. And because of that, and because we weren't really, we weren't ready to pick up and move our entire lives, that everything we knew for the first 18 years of our lives and just pick up and move somewhere else to another tax farm, but that's a different story, um, to, since we weren't willing to do that, we are subjected to everything they want to throw at us and somehow that equals consent. Well, that's slavery, folks. The only difference is in degree. So, I am an abolitionist. I want to end slavery. I'm looking to finish the job that Harriet Tubman and the rest of the abolitionists from the mid-1800s and before, because there were abolitionists before that who were trying to stop the chattel slavery. I'm just trying to pick up where they left off. And I'm looking for some help. So I'm going to put a bunch of links in the show notes. Um, there's many ways to contact me. Um, if you happen to come across this video and what I say interests you, um, or if you think you want to help, um, there's plenty of ways to get in contact with me. Uh, I'm also currently setting up a, a separate communication line um, that's a little more encrypted. Because obviously, as I said, there's going to be risks involved and I don't want, I don't expect anybody to be put themselves any more at risks than I would. I don't even expect anybody to put themselves any, at anywhere even as close to as much risk as I'm willing to put myself in. But I, I understand the, the safety issue and I understand the security issue. So I'm setting up a separate line of communication for that. Um, there will be a way for people to communicate and I would really like to make 2016 the year that the abolitionists were officially reborn my goal for 2016 is to reestablish an underground railroad for the new millennia so that I and others can help fellow tax slaves escape their shackles do you want to help if so, you know where to find me. I appreciate everybody who took the time to watch this video. I really hope to hear from some of you soon. And the uh, world isn't going to free itself. So when you find something that you think you can do, you best run with it. This has been Jeremy with another edition of the Abolitionist Abstractions. Love, peace, and voluntary interactions for all.